Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you're here for our Good Friday service. It's normally a service that is very moving, and, and it, I love having lots of people here. We have fire pots lit up and candles lit up, and we're constantly damping them as we walk toward Christ's death. And as we walk through this tonight, I hope that you're going to participate with us. We sent candles to almost every home through the bags for Easter. Uh, if you did not receive any, I hope that maybe you've planted or put a couple uh, candles in front of you. I have seven candles here uh, that we're going to walk through the last seven uh, phrases that Jesus mentioned from the cross. Uh, the center one is the Christ candle. As we go through each of the phrases, we're going to extinguish one of the candles. We're going to go from one end, uh, from the ends to the middle. 
And so I hope that as we go through this, you also uh, will have candles and will be able to extinguish them. If not, you can view it on the, on the screen and you can just walk along with us. Uh, for best effect, you can make the room as dark as you can. And that way the candles are the only light. In here tonight, I have no other lights other than these candles, uh, my iPad with the notes on it, and this TV. So uh, that really adds to the effect. And I hope that maybe that helps you to be able to see the effect. So as we uh, begin tonight, let me pray with us. Father, thank you that we can gather together, even at distances, to be able to share together the experience of a Tenebrae Good Friday service. I pray tonight, Father, that as we walk through the last seven phrases of Jesus, the last seven words of Christ from the cross, I pray that it would move us from deep within and that we would catch a semblance of all that happened, all that Jesus went through just for us. And Father, as we, uh, as we walk through this, I pray that you would just be glorified through it, that you would speak deep into our hearts and lives. And that, Father, we would be moved to become closer to you. Let us end this service changed because of this service. Father, I pray that you would just speak through me tonight. Use me as your messenger, I pray. Thank you for your love and your grace to us that you demonstrated through the life and the death and the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Help us tonight on Good Friday as we walk through his death. May he be glorified. May you be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to walk through the last seven statements of Christ. They're going to be on the TV screen here, uh, or you can listen to them as I read them. And then I have a, a small reading to do with each one of them. And then at the end of that, I have a few questions that I just want you to contemplate uh, while we extinguish the candles. So let us begin. The first phrase that we find from the cross that Jesus mentions, we find in Luke chapter 23 when he cries, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It makes sense to me that the last words of Jesus, or the first words of Jesus on the cross would be, forgive them. For that's the whole purpose of the cross. That's the whole reason why Jesus came into the world, was so that we could receive forgiveness. Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Not only are we forgiven of the sins that we don't even realize we commit, uh, but we are, we are fully forgiven of the sins that we know we, that we, know we commit when we ask Christ to forgive us, when we ask Him into our life and into our heart. But the forgiveness of God through Christ doesn't come only to those who do not know what they are doing when they sin. In the mercy of God, we receive forgiveness even when we know what we are doing when it's wrong. God chooses to wipe away our sins, not because of some convenient excuses or we worked really hard at making things right or, or that we uh, tried to do our own thing or ignored them. But because God is a God of amazing grace, and He has mercies for us, new every day. As we read the words, Father, forgive them, uh, may we understand that we too are forgiven through Christ. As John writes in his letter, if we confess our sin, He, Jesus, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and forgive us of all unrighteousness. Because Christ died on the cross for us, we are cleansed of all of our sin. We are united with God the Father as His beloved children. We are free to approach His throne. And, and, and with our needs and our concerns, we can lay them at His feet. God has removed our sins as far as east is from the west, as it says in the Psalms. That is great news. Questions for you from this word is, do you know that you've been forgiven of your sins? Do you take time on a regular basis to ask God to, to search your, your life, to search your heart, to search your mind? And if He reveals sin to you, do you spend time in prayer, confessing, repenting, and asking God to come back into your life and to forgive you of your sin? Maybe 
Maybe today you need to experience forgiveness fresh and new. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Second word from the cross. Jesus says, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. As Jesus hung on the cross, he was mocked by the leaders and the soldiers. Uh, One of the criminals being crucified with him added his own measure of mocking and scorn. But the other criminal, he sensed that Jesus was being treated unjustly, that he was being crucified unfairly. After speaking up for Jesus, he cried out, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus responded to this criminal, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word paradise in Greek uh, means garden. It was used in the Greek Old Testament uh, for the same word as the Garden of Eden. In Judaism, the time, in the time of Jesus, it was also associated with heaven and also with the future when God would restore all things to perfection. Paradise was sometimes thought to be the place where righteous people went after they died. This seems to be the way in which Jesus uses paradise in this passage. Thus, we have encountered one of the most outstanding, amazing passages in all of Scripture. Jesus promised that the criminal would be with him in paradise. Yet the text of Luke gives us no real reason to believe that this man was a follower of Jesus or even a believer in him in a a well-developed sense. He, He might have felt sorry for his sins, but he did not obviously repent of his sins. Rather, the criminal's cry to be remembered seems more like a desperate last-ditch effort. Though we should make every effort in our lives to live every day for Jesus as a disciple, in the end, our relationship with Him comes down to a simple trust. Jesus, remember me. That could be our cry. And Jesus, embodying the mercy of God, says to us, you will be with me in paradise we're welcome we're welcome there not because we have the right theology or or because we're we're living the right life and saying the right things and doing the right things but because god is merciful and we have put our trust in jesus my questions for you have you staked your life on jesus have you put your ultimate trust in him Do you know that when the time comes, you will be with Him in paradise? The third word. third word is found in John chapter 19. Jesus Jesus looks at His mother who's standing at the foot of the cross, and he says, Dear woman, here is your son. And he points to to the disciple John. As Jesus was dying, his mother was among those who had remained with him. Most of the uh, other disciples had all left, but not John. He was there with Mary, Jesus' mother. And, And it's clear that Jesus... Jesus was wanting to forge a relationship between the two of them. He wanted to pass his mother on to being John's responsibility. He wanted to make sure his mother was taken care of. And he now made John responsible to treat Mary as though John was her son and Mary was his mom. We're reminded that Jesus was a real human being, a a man who had once been a boy, who had once been carried in the womb of a woman. Even as he was dying on the cross as the Savior of the world, Jesus was also a son, and his role did not neglect being responsible for his mother. When we think of the crucifixion of Jesus from that perspective, this perspective of his mother, Mary, our horror increases dramatically. 
The death of a child is one of the most painful parental experiences. To watch one's beloved child experience the extreme torture of crucifixion must have been an unimaginable horror for Mary. We're reminded of the prophecy of Simeon shortly after Jesus' birth where he said to Mary, a sword will pierce to your very soul. This scene helps us uh, not to glorify or spiritualize the crucifixion of Jesus, but, but realize that he was a real man. He was true flesh and true blood. He was the son of a woman dying with unbearable agony. And his suffering was altogether real. And he took it on for you and for me. The questions that we ask here in this section, what does Mary's presence at the cross evoke in you? What emotions do you feel? What thoughts do you have? How do you see it from Mary's perspective? What do you th- why do you think it was necessary for Jesus to suffer such a physical, painful death as he died? fourth word is a word of agony it's jesus speaking to god the father and in mark chapter 15 we read my god my god why have you forsaken me as jesus was dying on the cross he echoed the beginning of psalm 22 it reads my god my god why have you forsaken me why are you so far away from saving me so far that my cries of anguish are not heard My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest or no peace. In the words of the psalmist here, Jesus found a way to express the cry of his heart. Why had God abandoned him? Why had he left him? Why had he forsaken him? Why did his father turn his back on Jesus in the moment of his greatest agony? This side of heaven, we will never fully know what Jesus was experiencing at that moment. Was he asking this question because in the mystery of his incarnational suffering, he didn't know why God had actually left him? Or was his cry not so much a question of an expression of profound agony? Or was it both? What we do know is that Jesus entered into the hell of separation from God. The the Father abandoned Him because Jesus took upon Himself the penalty for our sins. In that excruciating moment, He experienced something far more horrible than physical pain. The beloved Son of God knew what it was like to be rejected by the Father. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Can I really grasp the mystery and the majesty of this truth? I don't think so. As Martin Luther once said, God forsaking God, who can understand it? Yet even in my minuscule grasp of this reality it calls me to confession it calls me to humility it calls me to worship and to adoration our questions as we think on his last words why have you forsaken me have you taken time to consider that jesus was abandoned by the father so that you wouldn't be What does this word from the cross mean for you? The fifth word from the cross also shows a bit of Jesus' humanity and maybe a bit of His divinity as well. His fifth word found in John chapter 19, I am thirsty. No doubt Jesus had experienced extreme thirst while while he was crucified. He would have lost a substantial quantity of bodily fluid, both blood and sweat, through what he had endured 
prior to this time of the crucifixion. Thus his statement, I am thirsty, was on, on the most obvious level a request for something to drink. In response, a soldier gave him sour wine, we find in verse 29. A sour wine was a cheap beverage that was common amongst all the lower class people in the times of Jesus. John notes that Jesus said, I am thirsty, not only as a statement of, of physical reality, but also in order to fulfill Scripture. Though there is no specific reference in the, in the text of the Gospel, it's likely that John was thinking of Psalm 69, which includes this following passage. Their insults have broken my heart, and I am in despair. If only one person would show some pity, if only one would turn and comfort me. But instead, they give me poison for food. They offer me sour wine for my thirst. As he suffered, Jesus embodied the pain of the people of Israel, which had been captured in the Psalms. And Jesus was suffering for the sin of Israel, even as he was taking upon himself the sin of the entire world. As I reflect on Jesus' statement, I am thirsty, I keep thinking of my own thirst. It's nothing like that of Jesus. Rather, I'm thirsty for him. My soul yearns for the living water of the Holy Spirit found in Jesus. I rejoice in the fact that, that, that he suffered physical thirst on the cross and so much more so that my thirst for the living water of life can be quenched. The questions that we have in this section, how do you respond to Jesus' statement, I am thirsty? What does this statement suggest to you about Jesus? What does it suggest to you about you are you thirsty for more of jesus the sixth word it's just three words but they're three of the biggest words that we could ever read in scripture Jesus on the cross in John chapter 19 we read, He cries out, it is finished. You know, I never saw a more, uh, a more difficult film to watch than when I saw Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. As I watched uh, parts of, the, uh, of Jesus being whipped and beaten and taken to the cross and then His crucifixion, there were times I almost had to cover my eyes because it was very graphic. Yet in an interview with Mel Gibson, he said that he actually had to scale it back from what it actually could have and should have been. Otherwise, we could have never seen it. I cannot imagine the pain and the suffering that Jesus endured on the cross. And then, I remember as the film ended, I remember sitting there going, oh, the relief that it is finished. Of course, I meant the movie while Jesus' last words, one of His last words was, it is finished, meaning His mission had been finished. The Greek verb that's translated, it is finished, means more than just a relief. Eugene Peterson captures the full effect in the, in the message when he says, it is done. It is complete. Jesus had accomplished His mission he had announced and inaugurated the kingdom of God. He had revealed the love and grace of God. And he had embodied that love and grace by dying for the sin of the world, thus opening the way for everyone to live under the reign of God. Because Jesus finished his work of salvation, you and I don't need to add to it. In fact, we can't add to it. He accomplished what we never could, taking our sin upon Himself and giving us His life in return. Jesus finished that for which He had been sent. And we are the beneficiaries of His unique effort. Because of what He finished, you and I have the hope for this life and the life to come. We know that nothing can separate us from God's love. And one day, what God had begun in us will also be finished by His grace. Until that day, 
We live in the confidence of Jesus' cry of victory. It is finished. Questions for this section. Do you live as if Jesus finished the work of salvation in your life? Do you have confidence that, that God will finish what He had begun in you? Do you know that you are completing His mission for your life? And in the end, maybe you could say, it is finished as well. The seventh and final word from Jesus from the cross. His Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Another version says, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. And yet another version says, Father, I give my spirit into your hands. The last two of the seven words of Jesus, the phrases of Jesus, were, were quotations from the Psalms. Earlier, Jesus had quoted from Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To express his anguish. Now he borrows from Psalm 31, which comes to us from Luke as, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. On an obvious level, Jesus was putting his post-mortem future into his Father's hands. It was as if he was saying, whatever happens to me after I die is your responsibility, God. But when we look carefully at the Psalm Jesus quoted, we see more than what first meets our eye. Psalm 31 begins with a cry for divine help. In verse 1 it reads, O Lord, I have come to You for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me, for what You do is right. But then it mixes asking for God's deliverance with a confession of God's strength and faithfulness. In verse 5, he says, I entrust my spirit into your hand. Rescue me, Lord, for you are a faithful God. And then by the end of Psalm 31, it offers praise of God's salvation. It reads, praise the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his unfailing love. He kept me safe when my city was under attack. By quoting a portion of Psalm 31, Jesus not only entrusted his future to his Father, but he also implied that he would be delivered and exonerated. God would not deliver him from death by crucifixion. But beyond this horrific death lay something even more marvelous than we can ever imagine. I entrust my hand, or I entrust my spirit into your hands, points back to to the familiar suffering of David in Psalm 31, and it also points forward to the resurrection. Questions for us in these last phrase of Jesus. Have you put your, your life, especially your life beyond this life, in the hands of God? How do you experience God's salvation through Christ in your life today? Father, today we, we come to You and we ask You to help us understand as best we can the death and resurrection of Jesus. Help us to understand the passion that Jesus had for us and every one of us as He went to the cross. As He took on the sins of all the world. He took on my sin. He took on all of our sin so that we could have life and that more abundantly. He took on our sin so that we could have forgiveness. He took on our sin so that we could have redemption and restore the relationship between us and You. And by His act, and as we accept His 
forgiveness into our life. We become your child. We become heirs with Jesus. And Father, I thank you for that. It's hard for me to wrap my brain all the way around that and to be able to understand how much I have hurt you with my sin, but yet you forgive me of everything because you love me so much. And Father, I thank you that your word holds true. That if we confess our sin, you are faithful and you are just and you forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. You forgive us of all of our sin and you purify us. You call us to be more and more Christ-like in our life. Help us. Help us to follow his command to love one another. Help us, Father, to love our enemy. Help us to to stand up for those that everybody pushes out onto the extreme fringes of the world. Help us to fight against injustice. Help us to live for you and to be an example to others and your witness to others of your love and your grace and your forgiveness in our life. Allow our lives to bring glory and praise and honor to you. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your love and your grace tonight. I hope you could hear the hammer striking. It's to remind us of the of the hammer striking the nails that pierced Jesus' hands and his feet. Tonight, as we finish, I want you to, as a family or whoever you're watching with, I want you to sit quietly and contemplate Christ's sacrifice for you for a moment. What it means in your life. What it means for your forgiveness. And then after a few moments, Tell those with you what His sacrifice means to you. And then, and then discuss what you thought and what you liked about this service. How it impacted you. And how now you can take this and impact others for His kingdom's sake. So now, quietly contemplate His sacrifice for you.